Well, it is 12 o'clock and I want to say thank you to everyone that is joining us today. Um, we have the great fortune of having our superintendent of the Shawnee Mission School District joining us today. You know, we're all living in times of uncertainty right now. And I think it's a great thing to look towards the future. And that's what Dr. Fulton is going to share with us today is uh, giving us an overview of an upcoming bond issue. So at this time, Dr. Fulton, thank you so much for joining us at the NEJC Chamber Luncheon today. Well, great. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, I want to the opportunity to talk about our bond issue that's coming up in January. I do have a presentation that I kind of want to walk through. This presentation is uh, very similar to the information that we've been sharing at our board meetings. So it may not be new information for some of you, but probably worth going through nonetheless. I'll try to work through the presentation fairly quickly so that when we get to the end, if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to respond to any of those questions that people may have. So let me try to do a screen share here and we'll see if we can get it going. Okay, here we go. In just a moment. All right, hopefully everybody can see the uh, big Shawnee Mission School District uh, slide there. Uh, we're gonna, uh, you know, everything that we do in Shawnee Mission is, comes right back to our mission beliefs and uh, that are part of our strategic plan. And so as we think about this bond issue, it is of course about facilities, but it's about a lot more than that. It is very much about trying to provide the very best education for all of our children that we can to be a good partner with the, com with the community uh, because we know that where public schools thrive, communities thrive as well. Public schools strengthen community and uh, we wanna make sure and be good partners in that process. We also wanna make sure that they're meeting the needs of every single child that we serve. So we have some important notions in our mission dealing with uh, uh, personalizing learning for students, giving them uh, the, the kinds of experiences that they need and their pre-K through 12 experience to get them life ready, making sure that we're inclusive in all that we do so that everybody has a place uh, in Shawnee Mission and, and we, we embrace all of our learners to make sure that they are, have the best preparation that they can possibly have for life. And of course, we also want to do it in a way that engages our community. And I think as we go through this presentation, you're going to see we have absolutely reached out to our community and asked them to help us construct uh, a future vision for Shawnee Mission. Our work really resides around three objectives. And we are, we are in the beginning phases of really taking seriously this notion of making sure that every child is involved in putting together a personalized learning plan that's meaningful for them, prepares them to be college and career ready so that when they leave high school, they have options in life because they've developed a wonderful uh, academic foundation. And of course, we also want to live uh, with neighbors who are good people. So we want to make sure that our students are developing those interpersonal skills that they need for personal life success. The other, as we go, as we begin this planning process, uh, we can really go back to uh, around 2016. That was uh, when the last bond was kind of finishing up and we began to look forward to when the next bond would happen. Now there's a very important concept here. You know, I was not here in 2016. And uh, it's important when you think about bond issues or strategic planning or learning in any organization to always be, of course, dealing with the present, but also be willing to look 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road so that what you're doing today is part of providing a really firm foundation for future generations and the work that they will be engaged in you're gonna see that kind of thinking in this bond issue. So work began on specific projects related to the bond issue in 2016. 
continued through 2019. In, two, in spring of 2019, we brought together uh, an action team that was part of the strategic planning process to develop some specific strategies forward on a potential bond issue. In June of 2019, the board approved the strategic plan. And part of approving the strategic plan was uh, specifically laying out this notion that the district did need to go out for a bond issue in the near future. Now, the planning process that resulted in the approval of the strategic plan actually identified January of 2020 as, the, as a good time to go out for a bond issue. For a number of reasons, we delayed that until January of 2021. Um, now the work continued on, in the fall of 2019. We brought each school has a site council uh, composed of parents and teachers, and in some cases, students. They looked at uh, our thoughts on the facilities plan. We also held facility uh, planning open forums at each of our high schools, talking about the plan as it related to the entire district, but also specifically to that particular feeder pattern for that high school attendance area. That feedback was really helpful because it helped us uh, to understand where we were on track and where we need to make some adjustments with respect to community desires. Then this past summer, uh, the, we had a couple groups working the, with a newly created finance and facilities committee as composed of, of patrons in the district began to re review not just our facilities plan, but also finances. So they be, could, could become versed in the concepts that I'll be going over today. Also this summer, the board uh, reviewed that plan, including some community survey results, and then uh, got some more feedback from the Finance and Facilities Committee, and then eventually on, at an October 26th board meeting approved uh, the resolution to place a, um, uh, a bond issue on the ballot uh, in January. The, uh, the, bond, the, the actual issue is on January 26th, but it's a mail-in ballot, so basically all mail-in ballots have to be in by that date. Our, our purpose, our, our goal in this bond issue is to continue to have Shawnee Mission be absolutely one of the best school districts in the country. We wanna make sure that we also are able to hire exceptional educators because we know that in order to have a great school district, it all depends on our ability to create a wonderful learning environment and meet the needs of all of our learners. That doesn't happen without caring adults. Great educators in the school system and a very supportive community that surrounds it. The bond issue proposal really focuses on four key areas. First and foremost, we wanna support student learning. Secondly, we wanna make sure that we're, this is part of a long range planning process that's very transparent. Um, oh, we wanted to try to also maintain a, a low mill levy rate, comparatively low mill levy rate, uh, when you look at how our rate compares to our Johnson County peers. And then in accordance with our plan, we also wanted a sustainable pathway to address um, workload for our secondary teachers. Our secondary teachers in Shawnee Mission teach more hours a day than their counterparts in the other Johnson County schools. Now, the challenge with that is, is that that means there's less time to plan, less time to collaborate, less time to interact with students on the kinds of things that are going to help us to achieve our three objectives. And so we simply want to give them a little bit more time to reduce that uh, daily workload of instruction, to build in collaboration time, help get personalized learning plans developed, and address, uh, address the needs that they have to become even better educators. And I think that's, that's a realistic and good thing for our secondary teachers to have. Um, I'm gonna go walk through a concept, a couple concepts now that are really important to this bond issue. Historically, Shawnee Mission has built new facilities from both bond money and from its capital fund. You're allowed to do that in the state of Kansas. What we're going to do in this bond issue is we're gonna say, look, we are no longer going to build
build new structures, new buildings out of our capital fund. We're gonna solely do that through our bonds. Now that is what a lot of districts do, not all, uh, but that's very common for districts to only use bond money uh, to build uh, new buildings. What that allows us to do is it allows us to shift some of our custodial and maintenance salaries from our operating fund into capital. Now, we already pay for some custodial maintenance salaries out of our capital fund. What we're gonna do is we're gonna shift several million more of custodial maintenance salaries into our capital fund because by law, we're allowed to pay for those salaries there. What we are not allowed to do though, is pay for teachers out of the capital fund. By shifting some uh, money from operating to capital, it frees up resources in the operating fund to add teachers at the secondary level. So while the bond issue is absolutely only about facilities, by making these shifts of new facilities into bond only, freeing up some capital for maintenance and custodial, it then allows us to go and have the, the funds that we need to reduce secondary workload. So it's all part of a connected system and that's how the system works. So with that explanation, let me now quickly go through some of the bigger picture assumptions. The operating fund, that fund that allows us to pay for teachers, also pays for daily operating expenses. It, it provides cash flow. And of course, that's also where we can add staff. Now, school districts in Kansas have been under a lot of financial pressure over the years. We have struggled to maintain adequate balances. Uh, what the board is in the process of, of doing is they're gonna work, they're gonna develop a, a policy and approve a policy that will say, we are gonna be good fiscal stewards. We are gonna maintain at minimum one month expenses or 8.3% 8 of our operating fund so that we have adequate balances to meet our needs. You really wanna have between 10 and 15% balances. That's kind of what you aim for. Uh, and that's what we will aim for. But at a minimum, you have to, Make sure you don't go below 8.3%. If you do, you're really putting at jeopardy uh, the ability to carry off, carry out daily operations. Now, we have a, a clear focus, uh, as I mentioned, on making sure that we're addressing uh, the needs of our secondary teachers uh, to give them additional time for planning, for collaboration, for uh, interacting with students on things like personalized learning plans. And so the way that we can do that is uh, we are gonna take uh, 2.3 million, uh, that's our hope anyway, if this bond issue passes, we'll be able to take up to 2.3 million uh, out of our operating fund that we currently spend on custodial maintenance and move it to capital. And the next year we would do about the same thing. Uh, we have already, walled off 900,000 of additional state revenue from this year's money to go out and start hiring teachers this fall for next year. So we've already committed those funds, that's good. Uh, and that, this strategy will give us the resources that we need, which we're estimating to be around uh, 5.9 million to hire the additional secondary staff that we need uh, to address secondary workload. Now, as we move money from our operating fund into our capital fund, it's really important that you not spend too much of your capital fund on salaries. Because as I'll share in a minute, the capital fund does some important functions. So we're developing a policy structure. The board is developing a policy structure that will say this, we are not gonna spend more than 25% of our capital fund on custodial and maintenance salaries. That's the max that we can do and ensure that we have capital funds that we need uh, to get uh, important uh, work done. What is that important work? Well, you can see it on the screen. Out of the capital fund comes things like routine maintenance, technology purchases, technology leases, furniture, custodial maintenance salaries, and currently also bond payments for some new buildings that have already been constructed. 
So here's what we're going to do. We're going to maintain all of those line items except for one, bond payments on new construction. Over the next two years, we'll begin to move away from, we'll, we'll get the current bonds that are in capital paid off. We'll zero that out. We'll use bond money to pay for any new construction from this point forward. That will free up space in our capital budget to dedicate to custodial maintenance salaries. Currently this year, that's 13% of capitals for custodial maintenance salaries. That'll move to 19% next year, should the bond issue pass, and then eventually up to a maximum of 25%. Now, uh, in order to do this, uh, we, have, we have to think about our mill levy and we have to increase it some. We have identified over the next 20 years, $750 million in bond issue projects. And that's uh, with an assessed valuation increase of two to 3%. Now that's a conservative number, but in everything we've done, we've been very conservative in our estimations. We don't wanna overpromise or overshoot and under deliver. So everything that we're doing here is based on uh, conservative assumptions. The bond issue that, we're, that uh, we have uh, proposed for January has a, a small tax rate increase to it of about $8 per $100,000 home value. So you can calculate what that impact on you would be. That would generate $264 million uh, in, in bond revenue. And in a minute, I'll go through what all those projects are. Now, in order to stay on track, future boards would need to consider uh, some additional increases as well. And we've been very transparent here. In order to do what we need to do in Shawnee Mission to keep us uh, strong and get even stronger, this is the pathway to it. And it does involve uh, some mill rate increase over the next three bond issues. Again, in January, we're only dealing with this 2021 bond issue, the, uh, the $8 per $100,000 home value. Now, what's in this bond issue? There are five elementary rebuilds. Deemer, which is in the south area. Pawnee, which is in the west area. Rushton is in the north area. Tomahawk and Westwood View, which are in the east area. There are no schools in the northwest area identified because those schools are either newer or in some cases, we've already done a couple of rebuilds there. So we look at what our facility needs are and base uh, our new elementary construction schedules on the age and uh, the quality of the buildings and what, what the needs are in those areas. So those are the elementary rebuilds. And then beyond that, we're all into the types of things that you would always see in a bond issue or would almost always see in a bond issue. Renovations to our early childhood center, middle schools, uh, providing more privacy in restrooms, um, as well as in locker rooms. We're going to do some updates to our career tech, career tech campus so we can provide uh, even more career ed programs. You know, we've talked about electrical, plumbing, those kinds of things. I, we'll have to determine exactly what those programs are going to be, but we want to expand that program. Uh, classroom furniture as well. We also need to do some technology and security upgrades as well as typical facility upgrades and replacements that you find with aging schools, HVAC, roofs, uh, playgrounds, and so on. We also, with this bond issue, would demolish the old Catherine Carpenter building. Total cost is some of this expense, mo almost all this expense would come out of the bond issue. A few of these items would come out of a, a commitment of capital funds. So the mill levy, we know that any time that you have a tax rate increase that always uh, gets people's attention. We understand that. Uh, we uh, really looked at what the level of support was for uh, this mill levy. I'm gonna go back just a second to one slide before I do that. Uh, this slide right here. You'll notice that when we went out and did a survey with our community, here's what we learned. We could do a, a no tax rate increase bond issue, and that got about 83% support. We said, what if we came out with a bond issue that involved this kind of a tax rate increase at $8 per 100,000 or so? 
78% of the folks on the survey said they would strongly favor or favor that approach. There's really no difference. There's no significant difference between the 78% for a slight tax rate increase and 83% for a no tax rate increase. Now we did also ask uh, patrons about uh, the potential of a bigger tax rate increase bond issue. And that was about $22 per $100,000 home value. And they were supportive, but that support dropped to about 63%. There's a significant difference between 63% and 78%. And so the board in considering and weighing the value of each of those three approaches and, and looking at what not only our community saw the survey, but also feedback we received of the Finance and Facilities Committee said, you know, uh, I think people want to support the bond, they're supportive of the projects, but we think it's fiscally responsible in these times to really go with a much smaller tax rate increase, even though there was support for bigger one, go with a much smaller one and get as many of these projects done as we can. Now let me go back to this mill rate slide, and this is, this is the last slide. It's really important to note that by the time we were to get done with all three bond issue, issues, should they occur, our mill levy rate would be projected to be at around uh, 55.889 in 2032. That rate, and our current rate is 52.115, so you can see the increase. It's a modest increase of a little over three mils. Both our current rate and even the projected rate in 2032 is well below our, our Johnson County, our fellow Johnson County school districts. So we feel like this is a good value, is keeping our district strong, is updating older facilities, is keeping our current facilities uh, in good shape and, and really providing good learning experiences for all students. And as a side effect, also allows us to address the learning needs of secondary students better because we'll have more staff to meet the needs of our children. We'll be more on par with our Johnson County peers when it comes to staffing at the secondary level. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll end my presentation and then I can stop sharing the screen here. Dr. Fulton, shall we see if there are any questions from uh, the participants? That'd be great. Um, David Waters has one, I think. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Fulton. Um, you know, understanding the, the limitations of the school district, for those of us who might be inclined to support this, what can uh, residents do? Uh, maybe you can talk about, I know there's a committee that um, works on some of this. What can we as, as residents do to help spread the word uh, about the bond issue and inform people about this? Um, and again, I understand that the school district has some limitations there, um, but uh, are there uh, people that we can work with or reach out to, to, uh, to, to look at this. Okay, David, I think I may have frozen up just a minute. So if you just quickly repeat the question, that'd be sure. great. I apologize. Yeah, I understanding that the school district has certain limitations on bond issues and uh, you, know, you have to only be able to provide informational on such. Who, um, what can we do as residents, as constituents, or who can we work with, um, committees or otherwise, uh, to get information on this to help spread the word uh, about the issue? Um, to, to get the information out. Yeah, Dave, that's a great question. And so let me kind of explain for, for those of you that may not be aware how this works. School districts are allowed to provide information only. We will do that through forms like this and also you'll see going live here either today or tomorrow, uh, a portion of our website that will be dedicated to information about the bond issue. Uh, that's the course available to anyone who, who wants to access it, use it, share it. Um, what we are not allowed to do, however, is to engage in directional voting. In other words, vote yes or vote no. And so uh, in, in response to your question, I think that there definitely will be people who will be interested in uh, promoting the bond issue. There may also be people interested who may not, who may be opposed to it. And in those cases, uh, 
what what those folks have to do is generally there'll be community members that will make themselves known uh, for what whatever position they take on it, and uh, and so you would just connect with those folks uh, to go with your direction of interest. So I'm being as diplomatic as I can here. <laughs> I will also tell you that we are recording this. So it will be out on the Northeast Johnson County Chambers YouTube channel. So it would be a great way to very educationally share what Dr. Fulton has to say. So please feel free to be able to direct people to our website or YouTube, I'm sorry, YouTube channel for this. Right. Um, Nancy Wallerstein. The housing market is strong right now, and we have uh, significantly high appraised values. How have you prepared for in case the housing market should tank? Would you just scale back the projects, or um, you know how how have you looked at this? We do factor in uh, those kind of considerations into our modeling. Once the uh, once the bond issue is approved, I think we'll be fine in terms of the what we the dollar amount and what we've committed to. Um, but that's one of those reasons why, when we did our assumption on assessed valuation, we went at about two to three percent. That's below typically where Johnson County uh, home values are in terms of their in terms of their increase in assessed valuation. But we all remember what happened right back in the. <laughs> Great recession. We're ever mindful of that. So we've, we've, uh, I think we'll be fine with the modeling that we've done. Um, I don't, is, wouldn't the impact would be less so on this bond issue than perhaps on future bond issues in terms of what would be possible with the kind of mill levy increases that we've modeled out for folks. Thank you. And remember too, I, and I don't want to confuse people because in January, you're, the vote is only on that first scenario that we developed for you, the 2021 uh, meal levy rate increase. The others are, is modeling that we've done for what would need to come next in order to get to that $750 million. Thank you. I am not seeing any questions in chat, nor am I seeing any hands right now. Um, I think we might be um, finished with our educational um, conversation today. Dr. Fulton, thank you as always for joining us. We so appreciate your willingness to come out and speak and to help educate us so that we all know um, what's coming up and how important it is because as a Chamber of Commerce, we understand how important it is to have our school districts strong. And we are so proud to be able to represent Shawnee Mission School District here in the Northeast part of Johnson County. Um, I will tell you also that at 12 o'clock, not only did Dr. Fulton join us, but our auction went live. We have our business awards that will be coming up next Thursday at noon. So we'll be announcing the winners of all of our business awards. So please join us next Thursday, but also go out and register at GiveSmart, you can go to our website to get the link. And it's a great way to support and participate with the Northeast Johnson County Chamber. And we do appreciate that very much. Any final words, Dr. Fulton? Sorry, I had to unmute, I apologize. Uh, no, I just thank you very much for the time. We, uh, thank you for all the work that the Chamber does. And I appreciate, uh, you giving us the opportunity to share a story and for all Absolutely. of you that joined in to to hear it and thank you all for taking your time to come in and listen today and with that i think we will end our program <laughs>